Okay, so this presentation is going to be on some of the basic characteristics of bacteria. Now, when we hear the word bacteria, we kind of think of gross, germs, disease, pathogens. Mm. And one thing I want to mention is that the vast majority of bacteria are fairly harmless. There's only a small percentage of bacteria species that even cause disease. So most bacteria, I like to think of bacteria as being the misunderstood kingdoms. They're fairly, fairly, fairly harmless, although of course when they do cause a disease, they can cause death and destruction, such as the bubonic plague. So let's go over a few of the basic features of bacteria. Okay, so one of the most obvious features of bacteria that I hope you recall from earlier parts of the school year is the fact that they are prokaryotic. This means that they do not possess a nucleus or other membrane-bound organelles. So you're not going to find mitochondria, you're not going to find chloroplasts, you're not going to find Golgi bodies, you're not going to find endoplasmic reticulums. They, they, of course, still have DNA, it just floats freely in the cytoplasm. Often you also find, besides their normal chromosomes and DNA, you also will often find that they have little circular structures of DNA called plasmids and you'll see more about plasmids in a little bit. Well, if you look at the diagram, you can kind of see certain cell parts that they do possess. They possess an organelle called ribosomes. Well, we've, we've learned about ribosomes earlier. Eukaryotic cells have ribosomes as well. Their job is to make proteins through the process of translation. They link amino acids in big, long chains, ultimately building a protein. At the bottom of the picture, you see a whip-like brown-looking flagella coming out of the bottom, bottom of this picture. Again, flagella, just like in eukaryotic cells, are used for movement. Now, the structure of a bacteria flagella is a little different than the structure of a eukaryotic flagella. However, their purpose remains the same. It spins in a, in a rotation manner and propels the bacteria through its environment. Going all the, way, all the way around the outside of this particular diagram, we see these yellow, goldish-looking uh, hairs. They almost look like eyelashes. And these are called pili. And like it says, these act as anchors. Now, one common mistake that students have made in the past is if I were to ask you, what is this called on a test? What are these parts called that stick out? Stick out? Uh, students in the past have said, well, those are cilia, and they're also used for motion. Well, keep in mind that uh, cilia is a part of eukaryotic cells. These bacteria right here do not have cilia. These are pili, and they're not used for motion. They're used to, to attach and anchor, anchor themselves onto wherever they are living. Notice how there are actually three layers on the outside of this particular bacteria. You have a gray cytoplasmic membrane. That's just the cell membrane. You have a green layer on the inside called the cell wall, and some of them even have this third golden layer on the, on, the out, on the very outside called a capsule. So this is another reason why some bacteria can be so difficult to treat if you ever have a bacteria infection. They have three outer layers of defense. And one other cell part that's worth noting is some bacteria can create what is called an endospore. Endo means, again, inside. It's a little cocoon that they can grow around their DNA and some ribosomes to help protect in, in the event that the bacteria is in a harsh environment. And in this picture here, you can see an endospore nicely labeled. Everything on the inside of that endospore is fairly well protected. Now, the parts of the cell that are outside the endospore can very well die if, uh, if, if the harsh environment is uh, lack of water. Well, the outside of that endospore can very much dry out and die. But the important ingredients on the inside of the endospore, DNA, ribosomes, these are all protected. So when the environment returns to being favorable, the endospore can just uh, grow back into another cell and the bacteria can go about its life. It's a real neat adaptation that some bacteria possess. So look at the bacteria shapes in this, in this photograph. We have spherical, rod-shaped, and spiral-shaped. 
And so many bacteria will grow in colonies. The only one you don't see in a colony in these pictures are the spiral shaped. The, sphere, the spherical shaped ones are all in a, in a group. There's a group more than one. The rod shaped, you can see more than one bacteria cell all congregated together. The only one who's living uh, by themselves in, in these pictures are the spiral shaped. So some bacteria can grow in colonies. Others will live uh, a solitude, lonely life all by themselves. So there are three basic shapes of bacteria, and you can see them in this picture. The rod-shaped are called bacilli. Bacilli is the plural version. If you ever come across the word bacillus, bacillus means a singular rod-shaped bacteria cell. The picture on the left is pronounced cocci. Cocci is the plural version of many spherical round cells. If you ever come across the word coccus, C-O-C-C-U-S, that's the singular uh, version of the word. And the one on the right is the spiral shaped. Now, the scientific word for spiral shape is spirelli, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure why that is not labeled in the picture, but the spiral shaped is called spirelli. If you ever come across it spelled spirellus with a U-S at the end, that simply means that's the singular version of the word. So if you ever have an infection, a very common infection might be a staphylococcus infection. In the word staphylococcus, you can hear the word coccus at the end. That automatically tells you that the bacteria is round-shaped. The bacteria that you can find in yogurt is called lactobacillus. That's the name of the bacteria that we use to make yogurt. Lactobacillus. The lacto means it lives in milk. The bacillus means that it's rod-shaped. So sometimes by the name of the bacteria, you can figure out its shape. So when it comes to how bacteria reproduce, in this animation we see a process known as binary fission. And binary fission, like you can see in the animation, is where one cell simply divides and splits into two cells. It's a form of asexual reproduction. Asexual means that only one individual is involved. And notice that when you only have one individual involved, uh, involved, the cell, the one cell divides into two, those two cells are identical as long as there's no random DNA mutations. Those two, D, uh, those two cells should be identical in nature. The downside of binary fission, the con of, of binary fission, is that this process does not really allow for genetic diversity. These two cells, and then if the two divide into four, the four divide into eight, the eight divide into sixteen, all the cells are theoretically identical to one another. I say theoretically because random DNA mutations might make them slightly different. But the, the downside with not having a lot of genetic diversity is whatever kills one cell can very much kill all the cells because there's no different adaptations that the bacteria may have. There's a certain topic I want to talk about also on this slide titled reproduction, although it's not really reproduction. You'll see what I mean. There's a process that bacteria can perform called conjugation. Now, it's not really a form of reproduction. Look in the animation. There are two cells in the animation. One on the left, kind of a beige color. One on the right, kind of an orange color. At the end of this animation, there still will only be two cells. So conjugation is not really a form of reproduction. But if you follow the animation, it says, the definition, first of all, says it's a process where DNA is exchanged. Two cells will connect to one another by what's called a pilus. Pilus is the singular version for the word pili. And so once the two cells connect in this animation, the cell on the left is connecting and penetrating the cell on the right with a pilus. Pilus is singular, pili is plural. And notice how in the animation, the cell on the left is transferring a round circular structure to the cell on the right. It's exchanging its DNA. This is one way that bacteria can create some genetic diversity. In this animation, the cell on the left may have passed on, let's pretend, the, the gene to resist the, pen, uh, the antibiotic called penicillin. So in this case, the bacteria on the left is resistant to penicillin, and it, it has now passed that resistance onto the orange cell on the right. The orange cell on the right 
benefits from this by obtaining a gene to resist an antibiotic or some other adaptation to help it survive better. So it's a neat little advantage that some bacteria can perform. Now again, I want to stress this is not a form of reproduction. If you notice, at the beginning of the animation there were two cells. At the end, there are still two cells. Once bacteria swap DNA like this, they then uh, divide through binary fission. When it comes to how bacteria feed and get their nutrition, there's a couple different types of bacteria. Like the picture shows, some bacteria are, are a type of decomposer known as a saprophyte. This means that they feed on dead matter. Bacteria are, are saprophytes, fungus are saprophytes. What they do is they release digestive enzymes onto whatever they're living. So if you have mushrooms growing on a tree, if you have bacteria living on, on a, a dead animal, what they do is they release enzymes onto whatever it is they're, they're growing on, and those enzymes will break down whatever it is that they're living on, and then they just absorb the nutrients. That's how they feed. They don't actually ingest their food like consumers. Consumers, like animals, actually ingest. They take bites out, they chew, they swallow, and that's how they get their energy. Well, saprophytes actually absorb their nutrients. And, of course, some bacteria can be parasites. We all know that bacteria can cause disease. Now, here's an extreme picture of a foot with a really nasty bacteria infection. And just looking at this picture, this person very well may have to have their foot amputated. You don't want the bacteria to spread to more important parts of the body, such as uh, you know, getting in the blood and then transferring everywhere where the blood goes. So these are rare, though. Most bacteria do not cause disease, but of course some of them can be parasitic. Some bacteria are autotrophs. We're going to learn about a group of bacteria in a little bit called cyanobacteria. They perform photosynthesis. They have chlorophyll. The chlorophyll absorbs sunlight, and with the help of water and carbon dioxide, they are able to make their own glucose and feed themselves. And when it comes to bacteria, let's not forget, they're really, really healthy to ecosystems. Here's a picture of a food web, but notice near the bottom are the decomposers, the bacteria and the fungi. Again, they're really important at adding nutrients back into the soil so plants can live healthier and ecosystems in general benefit whenever bacteria and fungi are present.